which leads us to tonight. What we value and hold precious is contained in the stories we tell. And let me see if I can get this to work. As you can see, even the songs we sing. Now, if you read my bio, you know that I worked for over a quarter century with the state of Illinois as their Lincoln expert and in uh, designing the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum. Now, if you notice, uh, Illinois is the land of Lincoln. In the mid-1950s, the state of Illinois had the presence of mind to trademark that motto, much to the chagrin of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, where Lincoln was born, as well as the state of Indiana, which claims that they're responsible for instilling in Lincoln those great virtues as a teenager and as a young adult. The Lincoln story even reached as far as the wilds of Siberia. The great Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, who's shown here, recalled going to the hinterlands of Siberia and sitting around a fire with the tribal chieftain. The chieftain pulled out a necklace which had a medal with Lincoln's profile on it. And he said to Tolstoy, tell us about the life and adventures of this man. Tolstoy was amazed that even Lincoln's reputation had reached into the hinterlands of Siberia. Now, all great stories become part of popular culture. With Lincoln, Seth Graham Smith took the story of Lincoln and mashed it with vampires and made a, a, a popular book, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Steven Spielberg made a bestseller, or a very popular film. Uh, and yet, when I started working with the state of Illinois back in 1985, the most frequently asked question I received was, where's the Lincoln Museum? And of course, there wasn't one. On April 19th, 2005, the museum finally opened to the public. To date, over five million people have gone through the doors to learn about Lincoln's life and legacy. Springfield is a town of about 117,000 people. And so it's also a significant uh, economic uh, incentive for the city. The question that I got when I decided to leave Lincoln for Hoover in 2011 was, why? <laughs> the, imp the implication being that I was actually trading down. <laughs> and I explained to them, I said, you know, I'm not trading down. I said, at worst, it's a lateral. I said, but really, it's trading up. I said, the Hoover story is every bit as big and powerful an inspiration as the Lincoln story, and global in impact, in many ways even more so. The difference is, people always tell the Lincoln story. They don't tell the Hoover story. Now, Hoover has a very modest museum uh, in West Branch. It's, he wanted it that way. Um, but the big difference is that in Illinois, they're proud. It's the land of Lincoln. The most frequent comment that I got when I came to Iowa and when they found out what I did, they said, oh, you know, I travel I-80 a lot and I see the signs on the exit, but I've never taken it. 
I've never been there. So, if Iowa does not know or embrace the Hoover story without telling the story, historical amnesia develops and people forget how truly exceptional Hoover's life and achievements impacted not only 20th century America, but the world. And the legacy continues with us today. So we're going to do a little quiz. Hoover was the middle of three children. He was born in West Branch, and the birthplace cottage is still there. It's a little two-room cottage for five people. Um, his father was a blacksmith, sold farm implements. His father died when Hoover was six. His mother died when he was nine. The family was sent to an uncle nearby who tried to keep the unit together but couldn't. And so at the age of 10, Hoover was sent to live with an uncle in Oregon who had just lost a son of similar age. So in many ways, Hoover was kind of replacement labor for his uncle's uh, dead son. Because Midwesterners generally, but Quakers specifically, believe in modesty and humility, uh, those are kind of defining characteristics of the Midwest. And my children always have to remind me that I'm from the Midwest. I should observe those. Uh, but the following questions that I'm going to ask, I hope you will dispense of your Midwestern values and raise your hand if you can answer any of these questions affirmatively. So, you ready? All right. How many in this room began life from very modest means and were self-made millionaires by the age of 40. <laughs> you are a modest group. <laughs> <laughs> Herbert Hoover um, learned about this new university opening up in Palo Alto uh, called Stanford University. Leland Stanford made his millions in the railroad industry. Tragically, his son died. And so Stanford decided he was going to build a university as a living memorial to his son. And in order to encourage people to enroll, he offered free tuition to that founding class. Well, Hoover thought that that was too good of a deal to pass up. And so he was part of the founding class at Stanford University majoring in geology. When he was a senior, he met another person who enrolled as a geology major. She was from originally from Waterloo, Iowa, Lou Henry. Now, Lou Henry's uh, father was a banker and wanted a son and had two daughters. So the name Lou is somewhat intentional. And he took his daughters to go hiking, camping, fishing, to really love and embrace the outdoor life. When Lou enrolled uh, in the geolo as a geology major, all of the boys thought, oh, she's not going to be able to handle any of the field work. Well, she ended up outdoing most of them uh, with uh, her skills and her endurance. Um, she was the first woman to major in geology in the, in the US and held that distinction for 34 years. So quite an extraordinary individual. She was very gregarious and outgoing and uh, liked social events and parties. 
why she was attracted to Hoover, who always looked at his feet. He had this lifelong habit of jiggling change in his pocket. Um, and when asked a question, might grunt a one or two word answer. Um, I guess it, it does, it is a truism that opposites attract. Um, he decided that she, he would go off, seek his fortunes, let her graduate, and then come back and see if there was still that spark. He graduated, and like many graduates, couldn't get a job, and so ended up pushing ore carts in a California mine, 10 hour days, $2 a day. He then took a clerkship at a, a mining engineering firm in San Francisco, uh, Louis Yannan. Yannan was so impressed with Hoover that he recommended him for a job with the world's largest mining company, Bayrick Mooring in London. Now they were looking for a person with 10 years experience, 35 years and older. Hoover was early 20s, <laughs> um, zero mining experience unless you call pushing ore carts experience. And he grew a beard and uh, facial hair in order to hide his age. When he went for the interview in London, it didn't fool anyone, and they kept talking about how youthful Americans are, but they gave him the job. He went to the backwaters uh, in Western Australia and uh, took a gold mine that was marginal production and uh, of, of marginal income. And by introducing new technology and adjusting labor, he was able to make it profitable. But the biggest thing he was able to do is he discovered the richest vein of gold in the history of Australia, the Sons of Walia mine. And the mine is still in operation today. So Baywick Morin were very happy with him and they said, okay, we have this new contract with China and we'd like you to go and map out the mineral reserves and he said, I'll do that if I need to go back to the United States first. And so he went back to the US, whirlwind romance. He and Lou were married and on that boat to China. When they got to China, they got mixed up in the Boxer Rebellion. But from there on, Hoover kept going from one success to another for Baywick Moore, and he found an ancient silver mine in Burma that was still produced, uh, that by adding new technology was able to extract um, tremendous amounts of silver, um, palladium, copper in the Ural Mountains. Hoover traveled six of the seven continents. Of all the presidents we've had, Hoover knew more about the world before he took office than anyone before or since, and probably than that we'll ever have. And understand where Hoover went and where he stayed and where he worked were not the fashionable capitals of these countries. The ore that was extracted was in the most remote and desolate parts of these countries. He knew and saw world poverty up close, and actually he shared in those mean conditions because they didn't have luxury hotels, uh, you know, where they were had the mines, and. Hoover also, though, understood world currency exchanges, trade patterns, world economies. I mean, really, when you think about what his career as a mining engineer did, you, you understand it gave him 
up-close experience on learning about the world. Um, and so by 1914, he had set up his own consulting business, had offices on six of the seven continents. He and his wife um, calculated that they had traveled around the globe at least five times by 1914. They were both 40 years old and their 10-year-old son twice. Um, and he was a multimillionaire, and then the war hit. So, second question. Of those multimillionaires out there at the age of 40, how many of you have devoted your lives and fortunes in pursuit of public service and philanthropy. Okay, so, uh, we'll talk about the conscious decision made that, uh, that Hoover made in 1914 to essentially walk away from his fortune, put it in trust, and then spend the next, what would be 50 years um, using, living off of his income in order to serve without compensation, philanthropic causes, and public service. Um, both the Hoovers, because of their experience in world travels and seeing um, poverty up close, but also seeing the effect that World War I had upon children. Um, they, they understood that children, in order to develop properly, needed a loving environment. They needed to have the safety net of proper nutrition and, most important, mentorship. They needed to have role models that could, they could turn to to help guide them through life. Hoover was especially concerned about what he was seeing largely in urban areas where more and more boys were anchorless and wandering the streets. And so he became very active in the Boys Club of America, now the Boys and Girls Club because he wanted them to have a safe place to go and not get caught up in gangs um, and become productive citizens. And both the Hoovers felt that children are the future and how you treat someone as a child will be reflected in how they treat people as an adult. Um, Mrs. Hoover was very active in the Girl Scouts. She felt that girls needed to develop leadership qualities and qualities of self-sufficiency and in esteem. And so she took an organization of several hundred thousand girls and grew it to over a million. Um, she was always disappointed when one of her young protégés that as secretary or as, a, as assistant would get married because she knew that rather than pursuing their own ambitions and dreams, once they got married, that those would become subservient to the husband. And um, I think Lou felt that there was no reason why wives couldn't also you know, pursue their own uh, goals and, and achievements. Okay, how many in this room have led humanitarian efforts that resulted in feeding millions of people? All right, so 1914, we're back in London with Lou, her husband, and the two young boys. Early August, war breaks out on the continent. The 
Vancouver's are rather surprised. They're seeing these long lines outside of the U.S. Embassy. And they're wondering, what is that? Well, they realized that those were American tourists that had come expecting to do the grand tour of Europe. And once they got off the boat and war had been declared, those passenger liners were confiscated by the British government for the war effort. And their luggage never made it off and catch up with them. They also discovered that the British government had closed the banks to prevent a run. And as a result, these Americans had American currency that they couldn't exchange. They might have traveler's checks, but no one wanted to take those. And um, or letters uh, of currency. So th these Americans often didn't have a change of clothing. They didn't have a place to stay, and they didn't have any money to buy food. When the Hoovers found out about it, Herbert Hoover called up friends, collected as much money as he could, and they went to the Savoy Hotel, which was the typical gathering place for Americans. From early August through mid-October, Herbert dealt with the men, Lou, the women and children. What do you need immediately? What's your immediate need? And simply on a handshake and a promise to repay, they were given money. Congress then sent over a uh, additional funds that the Hoovers distributed. All in all, they handed out over a million dollars and all but three to 400 was repaid. They also found passage home for over 100,000 Americans, including a Wild West show that had been in Poland and managed to make it to London. Um, so once that crisis was over, Hoover sent Lou and the two boys home, and he planned to immediately catch up with them on the next boat. But one of his mining engineering friends showed up, a fellow named Miller Schaller. And Schaller said, you know, I married a Belgian woman, and the Germans, rather than invading France over the common border that they share with France, went through neutral Luxembourg and Belgium in order to try to quickly get to Paris. Now, the British and French were able to stop them before that, but not until the Germans occupied over 90% of Belgium and large parts of northern France. Now, in peacetime, Belgium being the most industrialized and pop densely populated country of Europe at that time, imported 80% of their foodstuffs. Once the Germans occupied most of Belgium, the British and French imposed an embargo. Food could no longer go into those parts. What that meant is by October, and the major cities, there were food shortages and um, starvation conditions started to set in. Schaller was sent by the government in exile to try to buy food from the British. And the British said, we'll sell it to you, but you can't take it to those German-occupied areas where it was most needed. So he said, can you help? Now think about it. If someone were to ask you to do that, I mean, I, it's like, how could I, how could I get the, all of these warring parties, these major powers, to agree to allow food into a country? Plus, when you think about it, 
Hoover, with his mining career, could have made tons more money selling iron ore and, and other kinds of mineral ore to warring countries to make weapons and other things. But Hoover said, let me, let me think about it. He woke up the next day and it was reported that he said, let the fortune go to hell. And what he did, that's, he made a conscious decision. He was gonna walk away from his fortune and he was going to find a way to deal with this problem of feeding non-combatants. He ended up creating an independent organization, not tied with any country, called the Commission for Relief in Belgium. And through a set of very hard negotiations, got the German, the British, and the French governments to agree to respect the neutrality of this organization and to, in effect, extend all of the rights that they would of a nation state. You know, today we would call that organization a non-governmental organization, like Doctors Without Borders. Um, so, that was the easy part. The hard part came was that Hoover had to raise the money to purchase the food, buy neutral ships to transport the food to Rotterdam, the Netherlands was a neutral country in World War I, and they agreed to transport the food from Rotterdam on canals and on railroads to the German-occupied Belgium. There, the German army, along with members of the Commission for Relief in Belgium, inspect the food to make sure that there was no contraband it would go in a warehouse, and then they worked with a national group, the, the National Committee in Belgium, of, and then also a similar organization in northern France, and the food then was distributed to about 1,200 different distribution points. All of the tin for canned meats and milk had to be recycled so that it wasn't turned into military armaments, even the flour sacks had to be recycled. The Belgians took these flour sacks and although it they were intended to be used by the Belgians to make undergarments, um, they ended up painting them and making these decorative thank you cards out of them. Um, and we have over 300 in the museum as an example. But Hoover realized that the best way to feed the most vulnerable in the population was to use the schools and essentially create a hot lunch program where soup, a Hoover roll were given, which provided all of the calories and nutrients that a, could keep a child alive for a day. Uh, he, for those that were malnourished, there was also something that he had created called a Hoover cookie. And I guess it would, today's counterpart would be a protein bar, right? It, it, it added kind of those extra calories and nutrients um, to, to help children that were undernourished. From 1914 to the end of the war, Hoover's Commission for Relief in, the, in Belgium fed between seven to eight million people. Now after the war, uh, when the US got involved in the war, Hoover had to turn the organization over to the, the Spanish ambassador he, because he didn't want, again, that it to be seen that uh, his involvement um, somehow made it an arm of the United States, which had declared war against Germany. 
So when he came stateside, Woodrow Wilson put him in his cabinet to head the U.S. Food Administration. And it was Hoover's task to essentially get Americans to reduce their consumption of wheat, meat, um, sugar, and fats by 15% in order to provide it for the war effort, which he did. He went to Versailles with President Wilson and realized that there were huge post-war problems in providing nutrition uh, to the defeated countries. Here you see Polish children um, holding their containers for food. Hoover headed up the American Relief Administration, which essentially provided food, medicine, and clothing to uh, post-World War I countries in need, um, to Russia during the famine of 1920 to 23, um, and then during World War II at the beginning, he tried to provide food relief efforts to Poland and Finland. And then after World War II, Harry Truman reaches out to the 72-year-old former president and said, I need your help. I need you to do a post-war assessment of food needs. So the 72-year-old pre uh, former president says, I'll do it. Truman gives him this transport plane named the Faithful Cow. And Hoover goes to 38 countries in 50 days to do his assessment uh, of post-war needs. All in all, a conservative estimate puts Hoover's total food relief efforts from that period of 1914 to his death in 64 at nearly 100 million people. So, how many in this room in your respective careers have created standards for your line of industry? So Hoover is shown here as Commerce Secretary. Warren G. Harding offered Hoover his choice, Secretary of the Interior or Secretary of Commerce. Now most of us would choose Secretary of Interior because that means the national parks, right? And who doesn't love to visit the national parks? And Hoover being a great fisherman, you know, that he really would have loved that. But being Hoover, he picks commerce, which had the reputation of being the sleepy government bureaucracy that really didn't have a reason for being. Hoover takes it and turns it into a dynamo. What Hoover understands long before most people is that America the American economy and the American way of life was, was undergoing a transformation. It was going from a rural-based uh, economy to an industrial-based economy. It was also, with Henry Ford's invention of an affordable automobile, and Ford was paying his workers $5 a day eight-hour days, five days a week. So what did that mean? It meant that Americans had more disposable income, they had more leisure time, and they had mobility. They were no longer bound by their little community. They could get in their car and go. And because Ford allowed people to purchase cars, on time payments. That was a big innovation because it also allowed people to buy major appliances like washing machines. So all of these labor-saving devices were, were really transforming the way people lived their lives. And Hoover understood that. 
What he also realized is that, you know, if industries would just sit, sit down and create standards for that industry, it would eliminate a lot of waste in the industry. It would lower the costs of their goods to the public. And it would also eliminate the confusion that consumers would have and what they needed to buy. For example, there were 42 different size milk containers when Hoover took over as Secretary of Commerce. By the time he got Am I, oh, okay, got, got the uh, industry to sit down and create standards, it became pint, quart, half gallon, gallon. Simple. Dozen eggs in a carton. Um, he got the lumber industry to create standard sizes. The size brick in your home or school, that standard was created by Hoover. The standard of plumbing that is used in every building today was also created by Hoover. Um, Hoover took, regulated the radio airwaves so that radio signals weren't stepping on one another. He saw the future of aviation not only in just carrying mail, which was largely its purpose, but carrying passengers. And he made sure that airports and runways were lit so that when they carried passengers, they could do it in the evening and all hours of the day. And he also um, major achievement was highway safety. With the rise of the automobile, Traffic fatalities in 1923 were over 22,000, which was huge because there really weren't that many concrete highways. But much of it was being driven by people not knowing what the standards were once they got beyond their town. There wasn't even a set standard of what a red light versus a green light meant. So you can imagine when you travel um, outside of areas that were familiar to you, not knowing what the rules of the war road were in that area uh, would cause lots of traffic accidents. So Hoover convened a National Highway Safety Commission. They started setting the standards that were eventually adopted and traffic fatalities were drastically reduced. So, this last question, I see lots of hands. How many in this room have translated a medieval Latin text into English and your book remains in print? So, again, just to give you a sense of the intellectual curiosity of these, of Herbert and Lou Hoover, both were geology majors. One of the classic reference books was a medieval Latin text, De Re Metallica. Georgius Agricola was actually a German who Latinized his name. And of course, in the Middle Ages, all learned books were in Latin. That was the language of scholars. Herbert Hoover had no language skills. Um, we know that he took German at Stanford and he would have flunked if he hadn't dropped the course. Lou, however, was fluent in at least five languages, Latin being one of them. So what they decided to do is they would take this and translate it into English because there was really no good English translation that existed. It took them five years, five to seven, depending on how you count. 
They published it in 1912, and they spent over $20,000 in this little project. Now, why so much? Well, Lou need, got some help with the translation, but um, more importantly, they wanted to produce a book, their version of the book, that looked exactly like the 1556 version. So they tracked down a paper maker in London so that they could make the paper the way that it was made in 1556. They hand sewed to the pages. They reproduced all of the woodcuts. And then they made the binding out of vellum or sheepskin. They didn't sell many. They gave most of them away. And if you got one of these from the Hoovers that was inscribed by them, it was really something. And it's never been out of print since 1912. You can still buy a Dover reprint edition. So, with all these accomplishments, why aren't Iowans telling the story? Why aren't they singing his praises? Well, a little thing called the Great Depression. And part of it um, has, was kind of a successful effort by new dealers to paint Hoover as this cold, uncaring individual who believed that it wasn't government's responsibility to provide any help during the Depression. The Democratic National Committee in 1929 hired a newspaper man named Charles Michelson to provide regular weekly talking points to Democratic officials on what was wrong with Herbert Hoover and his policies. It was Mickelson who coined the phrase Hooverville, which referred to the shanty towns that were springing up more and more in urban areas. Um, now, of course, homelessness existed before the Great Depression and after, and you see it in any major city today. But it was because it seemed to fit the times, and more importantly, Hoover didn't effectively use communication to counter it. He believed that words are cheap if you don't have the actions and the results to match. And so as a result, the very popular notion of Hoover as being uncaring and um, a a failure has lasted for far too long. Now, of course, historians are very good at examining records. And they've realized that Hoover was not responsible for the Great Depression. And that really, the, the consensus, if there is any, indicates that the Federal Reserve failed to lower interest rates and to stimulate the economy until it was too late, until what should have been a recession had become a depression. But the other thing is we call it the Great Depression because most people tend to identify it with the stock market crash in October of 29. And it goes all the way through the end of World War II. It wasn't only Hoover's depression, it was others. And the valuation of the stock market didn't reach its pre-depression rates until the early 1950s, which again shows how deeply rooted and systemic the problem was. So how do we overcome this negative image? Well, we do a lot with kids. We have pre-K and K uh, reading books about the presidency. We have 
fourth and fifth grade school tours because Herbert and Lou Hoover's lives closely identify with science, technology, engineering, and math, which is very popular in school. We have done these pop-ups in the galleries dealing, connecting STEM to the lives of the Hoovers. Um, we do primary source materials, teacher workshops, National History Day workshops with kids. Um, we also do author talks, partnerships, uh, and probably the most exciting thing that we're doing currently, our foundation is undertaking um, a project to raise the money to completely renovate our permanent museum galleries so that we can use the technology of the 21st century to reach a 21st century audience so that they can learn how to live an uncommon life and to provide a life of service to community and uh, make positive change. Some of our exhibits, the one when we reopen, we'll, we are going to be reopening July 6th. Um, you'll need to get time tickets in advance. <laughs> we won't be selling them at the admissions desk. It'll be limited capacity, but it's a start. And we still have our Goodwill Tour exhibit that's up. And then in September, mid-September, we're bringing in a traveling exhibit called Da Vinci Machines in Motion. It'll have 20 of Leonardo da Vinci's inventions where you can hand crank and see them operate. And again, how does that connect with Hoover? Well, you know, uh, both were innovative minds, but more importantly, Hoover's eldest son, Herbert Jr., held a patent in being able to find oil kind of using radio waves. So, um, so what gives me hope is that even though Iowans don't much remember Hoover, the world does. Late August, several years ago, an elderly German couple approached the desk right before closing and they said, I hope you don't mind, but we left something at the gravesite and we just didn't want to break any rules. The following morning I walked up and it was still kind of a gray rainy day. And right before the gravesite was a solar powered light, the kind that people use to light the walkway to their front door. Attached to the light was a Ziploc bag with a heart and a card inside. The card read, um, a little light on your grave with heartfelt appreciation and thanks for being a light in our dark days of hunger you fed us and many hungry around the world. Two thankful beneficiaries, Marianne and Bildus, Germany. This elderly couple remember that as children after World War II, it was Hoover who provided them food. Every year I get about a dozen emails from grandchildren and great-grandchildren of people who are descended from people who were fed by Hoover. They understand they wouldn't be here if it weren't for Hoover's efforts. So if the world can remember the importance of this man and his story, can Iowa do no less? Thank you.
Yes. How did Hoover keep his wealth intact so he could continue his philanthropy through the depression? So the question was, how did how was Hoover able to keep his wealth intact to get him through the depression? Correct. So in essence, he put many of his assets in like a receivership trust. So he still kept an interest, for example, uh, in some of his mining operations. Only he didn't oversee the day-to-day -day operations. It was the trustee. Um, and his fortune wasn't, it waxed and waned with the economy. Um, you know, there are letters of Lou talking about, Daddy says we need to economize. Well, you know, I, when I think about it, I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, instead of three trips abroad, maybe just two. I, I mean, <laughs> I, but, you, you do get a sense from both the Hoovers that um, they really didn't care about money. What they cared about is what the money could do. And it also should be understood, in some ways they, they were very modern in that Lou had a bequest from her father, so she had her own money. Um, and in World War I, for example, when Hoover was heading the U.S. Food Administration, a lot of the men were in the service, and so that opened up jobs for women. And he was hiring a bunch of single women. Well, as in all of wartime Washington, whether it be World War I or World War II, there were housing shortages. And so Lou, at her own initiative and out of her own pocket, ended up losing what ended up being three homes so that these women who were working in the Food Administration had a place to stay. She was spending on average three to $4,000 a month on these leases. But again, she knew that it was important in order for the war effort to be successful. But they couldn't use the stock market or the, the stocks. Right. So and and most, stocks. most of Hoover's assets were, again, from uh, mining income, from the income from these mines. Um, you know, the, the, the gold mines in Australia, the silver mines in Burma, the palladium and copper mines in Russia, he sold out, which is a good thing because the Russians, the Bolsheviks would have confiscated them anyway. But um, he then had um, different mining interests in South America. The problem of trying to figure out Hoover's wealth was that he destroyed the paper trail <laughs> because he felt it wasn't anyone's business but his, right? <laughs> and I think, I think most of us can understand that. But it, it is almost impossible to recreate um, you know, that paper trail of, of his fortune. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? To what extent did religion play a role So the question is, what role did uh, Hoover's religion play uh, in, in his life? And it depends on who you ask. Um, obviously, Quaker authors emphasize the importance of his Quaker upbringing. Um, 
Hoover, in his biography, talked about how difficult it was being a Quaker and sitting, he was born in the quietest tradition, and sitting without even counting your toes. Um, what is clear because of his career, he was mostly in parts of the world which had no Quaker meeting house. When he was president, he attended a meeting house in Washington, but um, there's one anecdote where he was in the service and they were offering plate was passed and he had to bum five dollars off of Lou, you know, to put money in the plate. Um, it's very hard to see Hoover appealing. He talks about being brought up a Quaker, but it's very hard to see how that actually influenced his actions as a uh, in, in any of his capacities as a public servant, as a philanthropist and the like. Um, but it's a quietest tradition, right? It's the inner light. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, it, it's difficult to read a person's soul uh, and what motivates them. Certainly, many of the outcomes of Hoover's efforts would be well in keeping with the Quaker tradition. Thank you. Yes? I was wondering, how did Lou get all the experience with languages? Coming from America, where was she born? So she was born in Waterloo, Iowa. So, you know, clearly she was um, a very, had a very inquisitive mind. Um, and just to give you an example, when they went to China, the first thing Lu did was to hire someone in China to teach her Chinese. Now, I always thought Mandarin, but someone from China corrected me and said, no, Mandarin wasn't codified until later. And so it was one of, you know, dozens of different dialects, local dialects. But she was also taught how to write Chinese characters. And she actually became very fluent in Chinese. Now. On the internet, you see that Lou and Herbert Hoover would often speak Chinese to one another in the White House, so people didn't know what they were saying. No. Um, <laughs> Hoover knew enough pidgin Chinese to get him by <laughs> in, 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 in dealing um, with certain requests. But it, it was Lou that, you know, really was the student of languages. Yeah. And what, what's also interesting is that, you know, because of the way they had to travel, um, which was by boat, they had a long time. Uh, and Hoover, in his memoirs, talks about how he used that time to fill in gaps in his knowledge. And so, you know, on one voyage, he read Russian novels and, um, you know, French novelists and in another, you know, English novelists and poetry. And uh, it, when you talk about these people as being self-made, it's more um, not materially, but, kind of a conscious effort to make them their 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 character and you know their moral fibers richer and more fulfilling and i mean you you, you see this and and again they're they 
attitude toward children. And um, when Hoover was in the Department of Commerce, he supported a private organization and actually became the head of it um, that focused on children's health. And again, in the 20s, what are they advocating? They're providing free materials to pregnant mothers that talk about the importance of nutrition, of early childhood education. <laughs> uh, one of the things Hoover did as Secretary of Commerce was to get milk to be pasteurized, which cut down the number of ch children that were dying because of bad milk. Um, and, and, and so, again, it, it's, you know, part of the, the wonder of education and of exploring the world. I mean, it, it, the Hoover's love of children also kind of was reflected in their attitude. They looked at the world through the eyes of a child which meant, you know, it was always with this sense of wonderment. And when you look at the world that way, you never tire of it, right? You only see more possibilities. And I, both of them were like that. I mean, they, they, their dying days, they were still thinking about what could be done. Well, thank you for coming, thank you very much. and have, have a nice evening.